Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome everyone, and to those who's going to listen to the replay, glory be to God, um, good afternoon, good evening, whenever time permits for you to watch this Friday edition of Sunrise Meditations, this is yours truly, Andre Ford, apostle, coach, pastor, friend, if you want me to be, <laughs> if you want me to be, glory be to God, um, Great day, great day to be in, great day to be alive, great day for all the iHeart listeners, God bless you. Uh, really haven't always given my, my information, if you need to contact me, you can contact me at area code 864-402-9052, 864-402-9052, amen. You want to email me, you can email me at keem10319 at gmail.com. That's K-E-E-M-10319 at gmail.com. Amen. So we're going to get started. I'm going to piggyback off of what I did on yesterday during our Impact Bible Bible study. Um, glory be to God. Why it's good for us to go through. Why is it good for us to go through? Now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to go through all 10 points like I did Last night, and if you want to know, if you want to see the video of it, um, when we went Facebook Live, then just um, inbox me, contact me, and I'll be glad to forward that to you. Hey Amen. We're coming out of Lamentations. If I can spell it. <laughs> uh, chapter 3. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Amen. Probably going to start at verse 18. Uh, and I didn't spell lamentations right. Shame on me. Shame on me. <laughs> uh, forgive me for that one. But I'll fix that later. <laughs> Glory be to God. I'll fix it. Oh, lem- oh, man. I really screwed up. Hey, Sammy, how you doing? Glory be to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your new mercies. We thank you for how faithful you are to us, oh God. Father, we pray, Lord God, that on this broadcast... Father God, that you, your word would be um, received, it would be applied, and people would be encouraged. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, God bless those that's going to see the replay. Bless those um, who are watching live, taking the time to spend time together in the word of God. And um, we just pray for your will to be done in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. So, why is it good for us to go through? Why is it good for us to go through? Amen. Amen. In the book of Lamentations, there's quote unquote like five poems. We may say five chapters, but actually there are like five poems that Jeremiah wrote. Amen. When he was um, going through, he's also known as the weeping prophet. And um, he wept because of the um, a lot of the things, matter of fact, that Israel and Judah had, had went through and were going through and that he really was distributing. He was actually was... Um, did, um, showcasing, if I would say, what um, what the troubles that they were going to go through, and he received a lot of it. He received a lot of um, he demonstrated, you know, I guess what we call like prophetic demonstration. Uh, prophetically went through a lot um, in order for the people to see what was about to come to them. And so, so have you ever have you ever been in a place where? It seems like no matter what you do, something's always coming up against you. Um, sometimes it seems like you just been you've been bombarded with one thing after another after another. And a lot of times you're looking at it and you're like, "What am I doing? I'm not bothering nobody. Um, I mind my own business. Um, I don't meddle in anybody's business. Meddling that's the southern term over here. <laughs> I'm not meddling in anybody's business. Um, and I'm just trying to just trying to live a nice, clean, healthy life. Trying you know, try to treat people right, so on and so forth, and yet things just seem to attack you, you're getting attacked, you're getting um, character assassinations, you are um, being lied upon, you're being talked about, you're being backstabbed, um, those you thought were your friends and turn out not to be your friends, and so on and so forth, so all these things are coming up against you, and you wonder why, why, what, what is it, <laughs> you know, even, even when you have your plan set to do something that you think is going to be prosperous, do something that you believe that is good for you, um, but it's not so, it's, it's not so, 
and it doesn't turn out that way, but you're still wondering why. Why, when I think I'm, I'm heading in the right direction, that's going to be a refreshing for my life. It's going to be pleasing. I'm finally getting um, what I've been seeking, what I've been yearning for. And yet, when I get there, it's not what it seems to be. Um, it's like a place of, I'm going to a place of refreshing, and it turns out to be a place of dry, it's a dry season, like I've been thrown in a pit. Um, and I'm starving. I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. There's no, you know, when you think you're going to a place of refreshing, you think of something that's going to quench your thirst, something that's going to bring satisfaction to your soul. And you come and when you get there, it is not so. You end up, you end up being alone. You end up being abandoned. You end up being rejected. Um, you end up being, um, despised. You, all these things, um, come to you at a place when you think it was going to be greater. And so, but what happens in those times, what happens in those times is this, it's the point of that God wants, God still, God still has a divine purpose, but there's times that sometimes we're, there's too much around us, there's too much noise, there's too much chaos, sometimes there's too many people in our lives where God cannot get our attention. So sometimes we need to be placed in a pit. And what a pit means is purpose in transition, that there's a purpose for your life. This is something that God has for you. But sometimes in order for us to be transported into where he wants us to go, that we need to enter into a place where it's only just him and I, where it's just you and God. That's it. That's all. And so he'll, he can allow people to come up against you. He can allow people to be envious of you, jealous of you, um, despiteful, and, and all these other things. You wonder, like, what did I do? What did I do to deserve these things? But God wants some time with you. I want you to know this. God wants some one-on-one -on -one time with you. He don't want just, um, just on occasion. He doesn't want you when times are bad, um, when, when people are sick or family members are dying, and now you want to call on him when he's like, where... I've been here all along. You haven't wanted to talk to me. Now it's an emergency on your part. Now you want to contact me. The God who knows all and sees all. But when you believed your life was good, you didn't need me. You failed to even recognize me that I'm the one that's allowing you to be who you are to achieve the things that you're achieving. And you don't even tell me thank you. Mm. Mm. You don't even tell me thank you. So there's 10 things that I really want to go over to um, express to you why, why we must go through certain things in our life. And so, in Lamentations, which I spelled wrong, so please forgive that. I'm, I will correct that. Shame on me too early in the morning. Glory be to God. I will correct that on Facebook. But, in, in chapter 3, um, there's 32 sufferings that, that Jeremiah discusses um, that is happening to him. And... But it's only 21 verses, but within those 21 verses, 1 through 21, he talks about everything that he's going through, everything that he is enduring, and he's making these complaints. But I want you to know, I want you to, to see if you can tell me if this has been you, because in verse, verse, 30, verse 18, in verse 18, he says, and I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. That means it's gone. It is it's wiped out. That means that I'm so tired that. One, I've lost hope in God. Two, that even my strength that I believe that I can even receive from God is gone. It's empty. It's an empty tank. I'm done. I'm fed up. That's it. And have you ever just been to a point where you just throw your hands up and you'd be like, whatever. <laughs> whatever. It's going to be what it's going to be. I'm tired. I don't, I don't even have no strength to fight anymore. I don't even have no strength to argue. Let the people say what they're going to say. I don't even have the strength to defend myself anymore. I'm just, I'm sick and tired of being tired. God, if this is what you want to do, then you just do it. How about that? <laughs> because I'm exhausted. I have nothing within me to fight anymore. Okay? I have nothing left. Um, then he goes to verse 19. He says, remember my afflictions um, and roaming. Um, he said the wormwood and the gap, pretty much the poison. Everything that, that I'm taking. I'm remembering all my afflictions. I'm remembering everything that I've been through. Everything I've been through, I'm remembering these things, and it's just, it's to the point where I'm, it's pretty much, I'm ready to die. I'm just ready to get out of here. And so, in verse 19, the first thing that God wants us to do, um, as far as us on why we need to go through, is he wants us to remember the sufferings of life. He wants us to remember, because if you can, if you can think back, and I'm sure all of us right now, based on what I'm about to say, you can think back on one time that you suffered so much in life. Those things are not hard to remember. You can just go back. I can think of this time and I can think of that time. He wants us to remember the sufferings of life. Okay, based out of 19. He wants us to remember. 
He wants us to remember those things. Um, it is um, pivotal, uh, really, that we do, because when you when you think back about those times, think back to a time when things were very rough in your life, very very hard in your life, and look where you are now. So what we thought was the worst point of our life, now we can look back on it and say, well, maybe it wasn't so worse because what we thought was worse then, I'm sure somewhere down the line, we experienced something else that we said, this is the worst time of my life. So how many times have you said, this is the worst time of my life? Hmm. So as we go through, he wants us to remember the sufferings that we've been through. He wants us to remember, okay? Because one, it still shows of his mercy that it's been consistent for our lives. He wants us to understand the mercy. So he wants us to remember. Remember when you thought this was the worst time of your life, okay? He And it also shows his compassion and love for us. It also shows his compassion for us. I'm trying to go here so I can read, read a different translation for you out of the Message Bible. If it'll work for me. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'm going to go back to 18. Um, I said to myself, this is it. I'm finished. God is the lost cause. Have you ever been so mad and so upset with God? Were you like, you know what, God? This is a lost cause. You know, maybe you've been bold enough to say, God, I don't even know why. I spent time with you. I don't know why I served you. I don't know why I've, I've given. I've been nice to people. You know, I let people talk about me. I turned my right cheek, turned my left cheek. I, I've done everything, trying to do everything I could to obey your word, obey your commandments, all these other things. And then this is what I get. This is what I get. So the Message Bible says in Lamentations 3 and 18, it says, I said to myself, this is it. How many times have you said to yourself, this is it? I'm finished. I'm done. I'm done with church. I'm done with church, folks. I'm, I'm tired of this and I'm tired of that. I'm tired of going to church and I'm being hurt, I'm being hurt by this person or that person. And this is supposed to be a safe place. You know, blase, blase, blase. We go through these things. Okay, we go through these things. And then verse 19, it says, I'll never forget the trouble. I'll never forget the trouble, the utter, the utter lostness, the taste of ashes, the poison I've swallowed. How much poison have we swallowed when people have spoken against you? When people have come up against you, how much have you swallowed? How much because you're trying, oh my God, how much because you've tried to do right, you try not to retaliate against people, you, you feel like you have a right in your flesh to let them have a piece of your mind. That's the piece of your mind that's not saved, the piece of mind that has not been converted, the piece of the mind that's, that doesn't care about what would Jesus do. That part of your mind that you want to release, but you don't. So you are swallowing the poison of their words. You're swallowing the poison of their actions. You're swallowing swallowing you're swallowing and so you can't forget you don't forget you taste the ashes of death <laughs> because you're you're constantly dying not to retaliate you're, you're you're dying not to jump on their level okay knowing that you're gonna have to repent if you do and so you're trying not to repent you're trying to even even not have thoughts of words that you want to release to them even though god knows our he knows our every thought he knows it before they're even formed so even right then if you have an ungodly thought you automatically you might as well go ahead and repent for it but all these things we're trying not to release back because we're being assaulted on every side we're being perplexed complex we're being um, persecuted all these things and you still ask yourself why what have I done to deserve this? What have I done to deserve this? So he wants us to remember the sufferings of our life. Because when we remember, when we go way back and we remember, we, if, you, if you just think all by yourself, <laughs> when you're alone, and you think about some of the wickedest things you've done, before the eyesight of God, because there's nothing we can do that we can hide from God. There's no act, there's no words, there's no actions, there's nothing we can do. Well, we can escape God. So we hide from man. We hide, We try to do our little secret sins and, you know, behind the scenes, after dark, during the daytime, whenever nobody's around. We do all those things that we think God does not see. And he sees every little thing. In Ecclesiastics, he says that every secret thing will be exposed. Every secret thing will be exposed. It will be exposed. And so we're here, but in that suffering, I want you to remember the sufferings of life. Remember, I want you to remember, remember 
these things that when you've been through some stuff, remember how gracious God has been in your life. Remember how gracious God has been in your life. Okay, so we want to remember the sufferings of life is number one. Number two is um, letting them make, um, is letting those sufferers make, <laughs> excuse me, is letting those things um, that we've been through make us humble instead of bitter. Making those 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 times of suffering, those times, those worst times that we said were in our life and allowing them not to make us bitter, but to humble us. Because if it is, sometimes we need to be humble. Sometimes we're so prideful. Sometimes we're so boastful about ourselves and where we come from and what we're doing and, and our positions on our jobs and everything else that sometimes we need to suffer so we can become humble. But in the midst of that process, we don't want to be bitter. We don't want to become bitter. Because where God has taken us, you don't want to walk into your promised land with a bitter heart. You don't. You don't want to go through the process of everything that it took for you to get to where God has showed you he wants you to be. And you end up and your heart is no longer a heart of flesh, but it's a heart of stone. Or stones. Malice, hatred, bitterness, resentment. All these things have built up because of what you had to go through to get where God wanted you to go. So you can't even enjoy the promise of what God has for you, what he's shown you in your dreams and visions, because the process of what it took for you to get there, has, has you have allowed it to turn your heart to bitterness instead of allowing it to make you better. It's, it's not allowing it to, to, to humble you in the process. And so I tell people, and I say this all the time, whatever you're going through, whatever processes that you're going through in life, in, in, in whatever that particular season is, ask God, what is it that you want me to know? What is it that you want me to learn? What is it about myself? Because in those times when you're all alone, when you've been abandoned, rejected, left all alone, left to die, God wants to show you that there's more inside of you than what you think. And he also wants to reveal to you who he is. And sometimes the only way God can reveal to us who he is to us is only if we be isolated. Because then the only dependency we can have is in God. All we can have is in God. See, a lot of times when we, when we go through stuff, we contact everybody else but God. And then when those people, when God cuts them off from contacting us or helping us through, then, only then, at times, we reach out to him. Because there's no one else there. So we're always, most of the time we're always reaching out for the human connection, the human help, and not going to the one who knows everything that's going on in our life. Okay? So when we're going through, you want to make sure that your pit experiences, okay, your purpose in transition, purpose in transition, P-I-T, that you are, you are, you're going to allow these things not to make you bitter, but to make you a better person, Okay? So it means that you're going to have to come off your pride. You're going to have to come off your high horse. And you're going to have to humble yourself. Sometimes God will strip things away from you. Sometimes he'll strip people away from you. So he can get you all by yourself. A lot of times, a lot of times we are waiting for God. We're waiting for God to answer us. We're waiting for God to do some things for us. And we can't hear his voice because there's too much noise. There's too much clatter. There's too much chaos around us. There's too much chaos around us. Too much. So some of our prayers are probably being answered, but we can't hear the stillness and the quietness of God's voice because there's too much noise around us. It's too much noise. We can't decipher if God is speaking to us or not. We don't know if it's his voice. Is it my voice that's talking to me? We know Satan. Well, you should know Satan's voice. Satan's voice goes against the word of God. <laughs> and so and Satan's voice, Satan voice will try to get you to... to um, for you to act out of your emotions and for you to be prideful. So he'll do things that that be contrary to the word of God. And he'll also he'll also counterfeit some things. He'll make he'll make some things look good for you. He'll make some people look good for you and they're not good for you. He'll make some things look good for you. He makes some opportunities look good and they're not good for you. And he'll have you think it's God and it's not. Okay? So number three is having hope in God. Having hope in God. Having hope in God. Uh, I'm trying to make sure I'm, I'm parallel, parallel, <laughs> doing a parallel with these scriptures here. Okay. So in verse twenty, let me go back to number two. Letting letting them make make you humble. Make these sufferings of life make you humble. So verse twenty says, "My soul still remembers and sinks 
within me. My soul still is remembered. And so in the um uh, in the message Bible says, I remember it all. Oh, how well I remember the feeling of hitting rock bottom. Do you remember hitting rock bottom? Have there been times in your life you hit rock bottom? You have nowhere else to go. You don't, you don't know who you can call on. You don't know everybody's bailed on you or it maybe seem like they bailed on you. Sometimes God has blocked them from providing for you. Whatever the case is, you have hit rock bottom. You, you're scraping the barrel, <laughs> the, you, you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. You have, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know how you're going to eat. You don't know how you're going to feed your kids. You don't know how you're going to get to work. You, you just don't know. You've hit rock bottom. You don't see nothing coming in. Nothing, you don't see no light, no ray of light, nowhere, anything, nothing at all. You have hit rock bottom. Rock bottom. And when you hit rock bottom, you do become humble. You do become humble. I said last night there was a time back, uh, probably around 2007, and everything in my house was just stripped away from me. The place I was raised, everything was just stripped away from me. My little bachelor pad was gone. It was gone, wiped out. And I had a friend of mine, and she told me, you need to humble yourself and go get some food stamps. Go apply for some emergency food stamps. And I'm like, are you crazy? But I had nothing in my house to eat. I had no income coming in. I think the first time I had been without a job for almost two months in my entire life. And so I go to the, I go to the place to apply. And I'm looking around. This is how prideful I was. I was looking around. I said, Lord, I'm better than this. I don't need to be here. Hit rock bottom. Had to swallow my pride. Had to get the $167 a month food stamps. Just to put some food in my house so I can eat. Rock bottom. But out of that rock bottom, only thing I could do was turn to God. He, 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 was, he was all I had left. Despite the way I was living, still a minister, still wasn't doing right. And hit rock bottom. So the only thing I could do, the only thing I, that I knew to do, was just get up every morning and just worship God. And praise God. Tears falling from my face. Because I didn't know how I was going to pay my rent. Knew I had to call my mother. Thank God for mothers. <laughs> I need you to pay my rent for me this month. First time ever in my life I applied for jobs and didn't get a, didn't get a call back. Or didn't get the second interview. Talking about hitting rock bottom. Got a car with no gas. When you hit rock bottom you got to preserve everything. You got to preserve everything when you hit rock bottom. Whatever you have left, you have to preserve it. Because you don't know when your next meal is going to come. You don't know when you're going to need. You don't know how you're going to need that $5 you have left in your pocket. You're looking at your bank account praying that it's not in the negative. <laughs> rock bottom. When you hit rock bottom, it will humble you. It will bring you to your knees. It will. It will bring you to your knees. All right, so the third thing is have hope in God, having hope in God. So we're going to look at three verses here, having hope in God. Verse 21 says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Verse 21, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. And then the message Bible says, there's one other thing I remember. There's one other thing I remember and re and remembering is that I keep a grip on hope. How? How can you keep a grip on hope when you've been when you're going through so much? The reason why I believe that God wanted us to remember, because He wants to He wants us to remember how many times that we didn't we when we almost lost hope, but yet because of Him He kept coming through for us. That in the end we we're still not in that place anymore. So He wants us to remember, even though it was rough, even though it seemed like it's the worst time of my life, God, you still brought me through. You still brought me through. So, if you brought me through then, and you brought me through this, and you brought me through that, and you brought me through this other situation, and I was in a car accident when I shouldn't be able to walk, but I'm still walking, and I walked away without a scratch, then I can still remember enough to still have a, 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 a slight edge of hope that even with what's going on with me right now, I can still remember what you've done for me in the past. And if you brought me through that, then 
I, I have something to hang on to, to know that you'll bring me through this. So we cannot allow, now you see verse 18, he says that my strength and my hope have perished. So there's times in our lives where we're, we're, we'll think the worst. We'll think the worst we'll, we, and, and our perspective on what we're going through is looking at the glass half empty instead of half full. So we're looking like there's no way we can get through this. We're looking as if, look, I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm, I'm tapping out. <laughs> I'm tapping out you won. Okay? But in verse 21, sometimes we have to let some things marinate. Sometimes we have to get out of our emotions or what I call EBMs. We have to stop having an emotional bowel movement. We just have to stop and think sometimes. Sometimes we just have to stop and we have, just have to recall some things that God has done for us in the past. And he said, this I recall to my mind. So even though I recall some worse things and I, and I, re, I recall some bad situations and I, 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 re, I recall some heartache, but I also recall that he brought me through. I also recall that he gave me some hope. When I didn't think there was no hope. When I said that I've, 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 I've exhausted even my hope in God, he still came through. And so we have to, it's easy for us to recall the bad things, but what about the things God has done for us that will encourage us even today that we can get through whatever it is because he's brought me out of this. See, we have testimonies that we don't, we don't remember. We have testimonies, we have, we have evidence of God being good to us, but yet we forget the good because we allow the bad things to over, to outweigh what God has done for us. Okay. The other verse that's in heaven, hope in God is verse 24, where it says, the Lord is my portion, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. You have to speak life. Ah, come on and shout, Dan. <laughs> come on and shout, Sharon. So the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Is the Lord your portion? <clears throat> is the Lord your portion in your soul? Because if he, if he is and you know that he's in control. So why not put your hope into the one who has control over everything? Why not have control over the one who where the earth is his footstool? Think about a footstool. Think about you got a footstool on your couch that you can just throw your feet on. That's what God does on earth. God can just throw his feet. He throws his feet right on the earth as the earth is rotating around. As big as this galaxy is. <laughs> and the earth is so minute compared to the galaxies. He says the earth is his footstool. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. So why not put your hope in him? The Lord is my portion, says my soul. What does your soul say about the Lord? That's my question for you. What does, what does your soul say about the Lord? Thank you for sharing. What does your soul say about the Lord? Mm -hmm. The message Bible says, I'm sticking with God. I say it over and over. He's all I got left. Mm -hmm. Last night I used the illustration about Job and his wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? Now, we didn't hear about her no more. She was happy because he was a blessed man. Children was blessed. He's the richest man on earth. Now this calamity comes upon him. He has boils all over his body. And she's looking at him. Forgetting the goodness of God. And how the favor of God has been on her husband. And she says that she speaks no life into him. No encouragement. No nothing. Looking at him. With all these boils all over his body. And she said, why don't you just curse God and die? That's like seeing your loved one in the hospital. 
and you come and you just looking at them and you seeing the tubes and you seeing all this other stuff. That's like you saying, whether to your your brother, sister, father, mother, grandmother, why don't you just curse God to die? Just get out your misery. She was not a good helpmate. <laughs> None whatsoever. She was not a good wife. She was not encouraging to her husband whatsoever. And you think about how he was accused by his so-called so three friends. You had to see it. You had to done something wrong for this to happen to you. You know, you man, you was the richest dude around here. You had everything. And now this came on you. What you what you do? You made God mad. You did something. What kind of friends are those? And sometimes we have friends like that too. They accuse us of doing something wrong because something has just went out of something has gone out of out of control in our lives. And so we murmur and we complain with one another. Yeah, I bet you they did this, but you yeah, I knew he shouldn't have did this. Oh yeah. Yeah, I knew she shouldn't have hooked up with him. So on and so forth. All the, all this other all these murmuring and complaining stuff. You know, and, it, and it's, it's it's funny how how when when something happens, how all of a sudden everybody has a prophetic ear. <laughs> Every, oh yeah, yeah, I knew that wasn't gonna work. Yeah, I knew this. I knew. Really? After the fact. After the fact. So when you get to that point. It seems like you're all by yourself now. You're going through everything. Like hell is literally just burst through your life on all sides. Can you muster up the strength to say, I, I'm sticking with God. And I say it over and over with my soul. God, I'm sticking with you. God, I know you can bring me through. God, I know you will bring me through. I know you will bring me through. Because you've done it before. And you've done it before on my behalf. Even when I didn't deserve it. Even when I didn't ask for it. Even when I know I've been out of alignment with you. Even when I know I've been disobedient to you. But you keep allowing me to make it through. When I even seen people go through the same stuff that I've been through. Done the same stuff I've done, and yet their life is no longer on this earth, and yet I still remain. When people come up and say, girl, I don't know how you make it through. I don't know how you hold it on all this stuff. And can you say these words? He's all I got left. He is all I got left. Verse 26 says, it is good that one should hope. And wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Hope and wait quietly. Um, another translation, the um, Amplify says, hope and wait with expectation. Are you waiting with expectation for the Lord to come through for you? Do you have any expectations on your Heavenly Father? Not out of, out of anyone to have expectations on. It should be our Heavenly Father. You put expectations on me, I I'm, I'm, I'm may not fulfill them. You put them on somebody else, they may not fulfill them. Then you get disappointed because they didn't meet your expectations. We have to be careful who we put expectations on. You have to be careful. Because you may have a standard for them that they may, they may not be able to live up to. You may have an expectation because, see, this is one thing we have to do, too. We have to, when, when we're doing good for people, okay, and you do it out of kindness of your heart, you can't, you have to stop expecting them to return the favor. You have to stop expecting, because that's when you get disappointed. Because that's what happens, and what happens then is that we, we begin to recall, and we throw up a resume of everything we did for that individual. It's what happens. Because we're disappointed. Because we're disappointed. And that's what we'll do. And we'll get upset. We say, everything I've done for them, I've done this, I've done that. And so we just we just released this, this, this Christmas um, granite list <laughs> that we granted them so much stuff. And we get upset because we haven't. They haven't done anything back in return. All right, so that's having hope in God. Number four is waiting for God's salvation. And so we already covered 26, verse 26. But 25 says, the Lord is good to those 
who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him. Okay? The Lord is good, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. Have you ever waited on God and you really, I mean, you waited with, with, with true expectations? And when he came through for you, whatever way he came through for you, you say it was worth the wait. A lot of us don't know how to wait. We, we don't know how to wait. We don't know how to wait with, with expectation. Um, the message says, God proves to be good to the man who passionately waits. To the woman who diligently seeks. God proves to be good for the man who passionately waits. And to the woman who diligently seeks. The word wait is the word um, quava. Okay. To wait for. To look for. To expect. To hope. Um, this verb is found in. It's, this word is used 50 times. Um, in the Old Testament. But the root of the word is. Um, taqwa. And it means hope. Wait means hope or expectancy. It expresses the idea of waiting hopefully. You are waiting hopefully for God to do something on your behalf. And in this present reference, even in the overwhelming tragedies Jeremiah experiences, he had hope in God's salvation and was willing to wait for it. So in spite of everything that he went through with verses 1 through 20 or 21, after everything he's went through, everything that's come up against him, he was still waiting with expectancy. He still had hope that God would come through for him. Because remember, you go back to verse 21. He says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. And I didn't even get to verse 22. Through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed. Through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Because his compassions fail not. And the message Bible says God's, God's loyal love couldn't have run out. His merciful love couldn't have dried out. God loves us so much. <laughs> so much. That his mercies. He loves us so much that we're not consumed. Excuse me. We're not consumed because of his mercies. His mercies, that whatever you in, whatever near death experiences, whatever, whatever the worst heartbreak you, you believe you went through, whatever it is, God's mercy did not consume. He did not allow it to consume us. You're still here. You still made it through. You're still persevering. You're still accomplishing things. There's still things for you to do. Glory be to God. His mercy. See, we confuse grace and mercy. It is his mercy. Through his mercy, we're not consumed. So you wonder why you're still here. God, I thank you for your mercy. God, I know I could have had this disease, that disease. I, I, I know, you know, if, if I'm a cancer, cancer survivor, I knew cancer could have took me out. But I'm still here. Because your mercy did not consume, did not allow it to consume me. And then the other part is because his compassion is filled. Now, God's compassion for us. His compassion for us. It does not fail. Man's, man's compassion will fail. It will fail. It will disappoint you. It will hurt you. Prayerfully it won't. But it, it does. As long as we're in this human body. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall short. But God's compassion never fails. And so we're, we're so hungry for human love and human affection. Nobody, no man or woman can love you the way God can. No man or woman can love you the way God does. It's natural for us to have the human contact, the human affection, the love. It's, those are natural things. But you have to understand, even if it doesn't come, no one can love me greater than God. No one will respect you greater than God. No one will honor you greater than God will. No one will. God's mercy is his compassion towards us even when we deserve punishment. Understand that. God's mercy is his compassion towards us even when we deserve punishment. How many of you? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I can't see them anyway. But 
how many of you know that God should have punished you for some things that you did in your lifetime and you didn't receive any punishment at all? How many times have you blatantly, straight out blatantly, went against God's word and without fear of any type of consequence? It was his mercy on why you did not receive any punishment. It was his mercy. His commitment to restore us even though we deserve to endure the consequences of our sin and his covenant of love expressed at the point of our greatest foolishness. The Apostle Paul exclaims that God, who is the Father of mercies, 2 Corinthians 1 and 3, is rich in mercy, Ephesians 2 and 4. Where grace emphasizes the fr the freeness of God's love towards us, mercy stresses the freeing of our lives from the misery of our disobedience. Did you get that? <laughs> mercy stresses the freeing of our lives from the misery of our disobedience. Of our disobedience. Okay, I'm going to have to do part two on Monday. Oh, waiting for God. Did I cover that one? Okay. Yeah. So we want to wait for God. We want to learn how to wait for God. Uh, it is a good thing to quietly hope, quietly hope for help from God. It's a good thing. Wait quietly. Don't complain. Don't murmur. Don't do none of those things that you're just waiting. You're waiting with an expectation for God to come through for you. You're waiting for God. Waiting. Waiting. We're not in a rush. God placed us in time. He's outside of time. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. And I'm going to do number five. Seeking God. Which is the same verse. This is the last part of the verse of, of verse 25. To the soul who seeks him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. To the soul who seeks him. How do you seek for God? How do you? Are you seeking for God throughout the day? The Amplified Bible says the Lord is good to those who wait confidently for him, to those who seek him on the authority of of God's word. That should help you right there. You can take this word right here. You take this word of God right here. And you can go through and find scriptures regarding what you're going through. And you can pray those scriptures to, to God. He is his word. Pray it back to him. Find those scriptures that's going to give you hope. Find those scriptures that's going to help you seek him quietly. And you hang on. Those That's what's going to get you through. That's what's going to get you through. I'm talking about why it's good for us to go through. Why is it good for us to go through? One is remembering the sufferings of life. One is letting them make you humble instead of bitter. That whatever you've been through in life, all those worst moments, all the terrible times, do not allow those things to make you bitter. Matter of fact, thank you, Holy Spirit. Well, you need to release those that you have not forgiven. You need to release those you have not forgiven. You need to let them go. You need to let them go. What's done is done. No matter how they betrayed you, you have to let them go. Whether they hurt you, whether they lied to you, stole money from whatever it is, you need to let them go. You need to forgive your parents. Hmm. You need to forgive your parents. Your parents did the best that they could do. Because if they if they'd have known better, they'd have done better. But you need to let them go. Because some of us have, have bitter feelings toward our parents. We need to let the people go who have died. And they still have power over your emotions. You need to let them go. You need to forgive them. Even though they may not be able to hear it. You need, you need to do it for yourself. Forgiveness is not, it's not for the other person. It's for you. It is for you. Forgiveness is conditional when it comes to the point of of the Father forgiving you, Matthew chapter 6, around verse 12, 13. Okay? Forgiveness is for you. Because when you do ask God forgiveness, 
He's going to base it on the measure of how you forgive other people. So if your heart is hardened and you just say, well, I, there's no way in the world I can forgive them. You can say, well, well, Andre, you don't know what they've done. No, I don't know what they've done, but so what? So what? It hurts? Yeah. Yeah, it hurts. But none of us are ever going to go through what Jesus went through. None of us. Now let's talk about pain. Let's talk about the 39 stripes was really 117. Because what he was whipped with, and at the, at the end of the whip, was pieces of glass. Stone. So it was three cords to every, to every strike. So when it wrapped around his body, and they yanked it back, it ripped his flesh. So let's talk about pain. Isaiah says he was beyond recognition. So when we see Jesus hanging on a cross, that ain't the real image. When someone is, is, is beyond recognition, that means you can't identify him. So when they whipped him, it went across his face too. Flesh was hanging from his face. So let's talk about, well, you don't know what, they, what they've done to me. Okay. Do you have a clear picture of what they did to Jesus? And he still didn't say a moment word. He didn't say nothing. Somebody do something to us, we're ready to cuss them out. Forget being a child of God. We're ready to give them that peace of mind that's not saved. They ain't been converted. We're going to give them the prideful part of us that hasn't died, hasn't been humble. So that's why some of these things we need to go through so we can be humble before God. We want to be exalted. We want to move further in God. We want to do this. We want to do that in God. And yet we're still full of pride, still full of arrogance. And it's coming across the pulpits too. I saw this one thing about Apostle Jennings and how he degraded this woman or whatever the case is. That's not what we're supposed to do. If Jesus, hmm, if Jesus did not embarrass the woman caught in adultery, who are we to put somebody on blast? Who are we to degrade somebody? Jesus didn't do it. And then the man had the man of God, quote unquote, had the audacity to say, if you don't like it, get out of my church. Your church? I would have got up and walked out right then because it's not yours. It's not yours. Pastors don't have members. It's not your members. No. We are under shepherds to God's people. We're supposed to guide them. We're supposed to watch over their souls. We are not supposed to control you. I'm going to get in trouble for this one. We are not supposed to control you. It's okay to seek for godly advice. But in the end, you still have to make the decision. We are running. Mm, I'm really going to get in trouble now. We are running to our leaders to give us the final answer to decisions in our life. But what about the one who died for you? What about the one who paid the price for you? What about the one that says that you are not your own, you've been bought with a price? What about the one who has given you the dream and the vision to go forth in? So why are we going to man or woman To seek their approval. <laughs> Why? Why are we going to man or woman to seek their approval? To me, a spiritual father and mother is someone who has wise counsel. Has wise counsel. 
it shouldn't their their answer. Let me, let me tell you this. And I've done it and I've been guilty of it. And I'm glad I got the revelation of it from my spiritual father. In counseling with him. And he said, we come together to reason together. And he said, it's not my position to tell you what to do. It's not my position to tell you what to do. He said, but when we talk, I can give you I can give you wisdom and I can give you what I sense and what I feel. But even even if I was to say, Andre, I don't I don't think you should go this way. It's still your decision. And it's still between you and God. We're just having a conversation. You're seeking me for godly counsel. You're seeking me for wise counsel. Well, you don't need my permission. Mm. That's a mic drop. <laughs> you don't need my permission to do what you feel God's telling you to do. In other words, I'll still be here. Apostle McJimsey, love him. I, I love the stuff he says. One, he said, I should be your only influence. Pastors want to be your only influence. They want to be the end all. They've... See, Sharon, I'm going to get really in trouble now. If you don't run stuff by them, they'll get upset. Now, there's the vision of the local assembly that you partake in. Okay? Whatever church you're affiliated with, you align yourself with. There's the vision of that house. Whatever the man or woman of God, you should know the vision of that house. I'm going to ask you this question. Do they know your vision? <laughs> do they know the vision God is putting in you? Do they know the work that God is calling you to do for the kingdom of God? And I want you to understand this, that hmm, your vision and your dreams may not fit within the four walls of where you fellowship. And that's okay. That is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But can the man or woman of God help you develop, give you the tools and equip you for the vision God has placed in you? I'm going to go a little bit further. Do they even care? Do they even care or are they hung up just on their vision? by itself in what you can do for them they're not concerned about yours now some of them may be concerned because you give a lot of money some of us let me get in trouble again have bought our way into positions some of us have paid our way into positions some of us have paid our way into the boardroom. So I want you to understand that. I, want you to understand. I think I'm going to stop right there. On Monday we're going to pick up on um, the, final, the final five and why it's good for us to go through. And if you want to catch some more of it, um, if you go back through my page, um, I talked about this last night in our Bible study as well. Um, so anytime I go through it, it's always a different, it's always a different result. And so I want you guys to have a blessed weekend. All right. Be safe. Love on one another. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Uproot the bitterness, the hatred, the resentment. Let that stuff go. That stuff makes you sick. It causes sickness in your body. It causes sickness in your body. So I'm not telling you to be out here and be a renegade. <laughs> be a renegade for Christ. Amen. But he does want us to fellowship. He does want us to fellowship. Okay. The body of Christ is huge. It's large. It is large. Okay. But don't get caught up. Understand what God's called you to do. That's like someone, that's like somebody coming to me and saying, you know, I believe God has called me to um, to start a blog 
um, dealing with bullying, um, you know, with with the, the young kids and things like that. And so they come to me asking asking my advice or whatever, seeking counsel or whatever. And that's what they believe. They believe that's what God's calling them to do as far as a ministry. What is it for me? How does that look for me to say, well, no, I don't, I don't think that's God. <laughs> no, because I could be selfish. You're like, well, okay, that's going to pull time away from what I need you to do here for my vision. Selfish. Selfish. Instead, it should be. That sounds like good. What's your plans? How are you going to do this? How are you going to accomplish this? What can I do to help you? That's how, that's how it should be. That's how it should be. There was a woman who got blessed out of her socks at one of our services. And she wanted to share it with her pastor. He didn't call back. He didn't call her back. Didn't respond. Nothing. Why? She got breakthrough. Deliverance. Baptizing the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues. Prophesying. All this. I've never seen a fire of God on somebody like that. So you want to share with your leader. Look, this is what... And you know what happens? Pride sets in. Why? Because it didn't happen under their ministry. That's foolishness. You can't celebrate somebody's breakthrough? Somebody's liberty of being free? You better make sure you are where God told you to be. You better make sure. You better make sure that you are where God has for you to be. Don't put your emotions involved in it. Don't do none of that. You need to be asking the Father, Father, is this where you want me to be planted? Okay. Some of us, we know we should be somewhere else. But we're, we're sometimes you can be too loyal to a fault. You can be too loyal to a fault. God has been told you to go somewhere else. And the thing is, why why do we get upset? See, I'm on my soapbox now. Why do we get upset if someone leaves and goes to another ministry? The mind should the mindset should be one as long as they stay in the body of Christ. You're good. Now, if you're talking about I'm going to be a Muslim or I, I believe in being a black Israelite, some some off the wall. Some let's talk, okay? Let's let's talk, because every ministry don't have everything for everybody. So maybe this particular ministry is just it laid the foundation for you, but you know you need more. You know God is calling you somewhere else, and that ministry may not be equipped to give you all those things. So you just go to another extension to the body of Christ. But why do we get upset? Why do we get jealous? Why do we get mad? Matter of fact, why do we stop speaking with one another? Because we no longer fellowship together on a Sunday or a Bible study. Now that's foolishness. So you're mad at me. You're upset with me because I line myself with somewhere else so I can further my spiritual growth. We got to get this thing together, people. We got to get it together. Amen. So have a wonderful weekend once again. I'm not closing no more. This is the final one. Amen. I appreciate all of you. I appreciate your comments. Uh, those listening to iHeartRadio, God bless you. Amen. All over the world. Uh, just loving what God is doing. And uh, appreciate you all. Appreciate you all. Be blessed. Enjoy one another. Let it go. Okay? Let it go. Those that done you wrong, let it go. Let it go. But they're not going to be the only ones that's going to upset you. They're not going to be the only ones. There's more coming. <laughs> Amen. As long as you walk in this walk, understand that persecution is part of the course. How in the world can you identify with Christ and not be persecuted? Not go through. Okay? And so, check us out on Sunday. I mean, we have service at 3 p.m. at 301 South Bunkham in the city of Greer. Um, there's some things that are changing um, in the ministry, so stay tuned for that. And uh, you want to fellowship with us? We have no time limit. 
Amen. We do not rush God. We wait on God. Amen. We wait on God. So, if you're looking for that typical hour and a half, two hours, you might not get that here. <laughs> because we want to be in the presence of God. We want to be in the presence of God. So, you are welcome. And also, it'll be on Facebook Live. So, either way, if you want to be at home or you want to come visit with us and share with us, we would love to have you there. You never know what God may have for you. Amen. When you come, amen, we want to minister to your soul. Amen. We want to minister to your soul and we want God to minister to you as well. And so um, that's where we at um, for this Sunday. Glory be to God. So enjoy yourselves once again. Take care. Bye-bye.